call the meeting to order based on the executive committee uh, sitting in. Um, okay, uh, the minutes of September 9th. Everybody had a chance to go through those? Do I have a second? A second. Any uh, ad additions or subtractions? Just the one that I was there and need to be added to the attendance. Okay, and we have that yeah. recorded? Yes, Sam spoke, but her name wasn't on the list. Sam <laughs> goes. <laughs> okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. If we're recording seconds, we probably should have a second from the executive committee. Oh, good idea. I will second it. Okay. Uh, no film. No, it's fine. So we got it? Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, staff reports. Um, Sue uh, Sinclair has. Uh, uh, ended her uh, retirement and she put in for retirement as of uh, April 3rd and um, the uh, executive committee approved uh, the acceptance of her retirement letter and she has offered to work with us on finding a replacement between now and the time of her retirement. So we appreciate that. And And another thing I was looking at, um, Sue has been with uh, the RPC uh, for better than half of its existence. You know, so <laughs> it's quite a uh, quite an attendance record. So, uh, and she's only missed one meeting. <laughs> no, that's not true. <laughs> when I, I was on about maturity. accommodation to say you've been here 50 years. Okay. Our so. sincerest thanks. Yeah. Right. yeah. Job Thank very, you. very well done. Yeah. And she's going to be around for. <laughs> yep, you'll still have me to moments. kick around for a little while. <laughs> okay. So uh, now we uh, have the minutes are done. Staff reports. Uh, uh, well, Sam, you want to? Um, yeah, Sam. Yeah, we're we just closed round two of the CDBG disaster relief uh, grant, and this round we have 20 applicants that will be evaluated. Uh, 20 businesses from Washington and Windsor counties. Um, so that meeting will be held the end of October. And um, it's been a real treat meeting the federal government's new environmental review assessments um, that they've uh, placed. I've never used a noise calculator before. Mm. Um, and trying to figure the incline on a road has been a little challenging. But we're making it through all the evaluations and uh, it looks like we'll be able to bring over a million dollars worth of assistance to these businesses. So we're very pleased with that. We're excited about our annual meeting on Thursday. We've got 120 people signed up to come. And so we are looking forward to hearing what's hot and what's not in the State House for the coming session. And uh, I'll give you a little report next month when I hear from these news people what they, uh, these okay. reporters, what they think is top of the bill. Will that be recorded soon? No, because it costs money. And <laughs> um, quite candidly, you know, I, we, we solicit... Uh, Orca no longer is doing, or informed us, they're not doing free videoing the way they have in the past. So unfortunately it won't. But I expect it will be very interesting to hear Steve Pappas, Sanson Tebbets, Paul Heinz, and Ann Galloway uh, discuss this. 
I, I would look forward to that. It would not be if I had already be somewhere in beer camp in Colorado. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I know. We should probably start holding these in July. It would be, be better for my schedule, but I'm not the only one. <laughs> right. I'll second that. You'll second that. Let me put it this way. I, I booked those plane tickets a long time ago. <laughs> I appreciate that. It's called the priorities, bud. <laughs> And I drew the tag even longer ago than that, mm -hmm. January. Well, that has kept staff very busy because the average application's about that thick. Who's doing the reviews? Primary staff, or you got a committee? Um, there's a committee of four of us. There's somebody from the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, <laughs> myself, uh, the executive director of GMEDC, and. Um, uh, and someone from Capstone that comes. And we have a scoring methodology for it. So that None of the membership? I mean, none, none of the executive committee? Or? Uh, no. No, no. Because it would be um, a real challenge to get through 20. I, I'm not kidding. It's approximately two to three inches of materials you have to go through times 20 is asking a great deal of any volunteer. Um, but uh, it's a little light reading. I drive around with a large box for a month and take it in and out of the house and read through it. But we have financials to go through. And there's a high level of confidentiality given what we require from them. We're looking at personal <coughs> assets and pro formas and tax returns. So we try and keep it to a limited committee, but with a set methodology so that it's fair to everybody that applies. You said you do Washington and Windsor County? Washington and Windsor, yeah. Well, who, who does the, orange? the little bit of orange, <laughs> we both meet in, in orange. I have Washington, Orange, and Williamstown and then Joan has everything south of, of that. So it's actually the rest of Orange County down to White River Junction. Don, maybe I could just add, we've had a business case manager that's been assisting with this program uh, through a U.S. Economic Development uh, Agency grant, uh, Laura Sutoff has been working with Capstone and um, it's been a really successful program. A number of Waterbury businesses have uh, taken advantage of it and they have. yeah it's been a real lifesaver for some of the businesses that were affected by the flood because there's a lot of flexibility in terms of we what work the money very can hard go to towards help them present a successful application. Mm -hmm. And we've named names, except that until they're awarded and they've been asked, it's confidential. So I can't. I can tell you the first grant gave over $800,000 um, to 41 businesses. So we're hoping for about the same this time on this grant, if not more. Okay. All done, Sam? Yep. Okay. Uh, anything else on staff report? Nothing, right? Other Just than town plan we need, committee. Yeah, we need uh, a okay. uh, commission at a, who might be interested in filling in as a um, um, on the plan on the town plan review for Northfield. Just if anybody's interested, if there's any adjoining towns. Right, there's five members on the committee, and we just always open it up to commissioners if someone else would like to participate. We don't actually need another person. Right, on, no. But, Correct. Um, Public the hearing will be at the... Berlin will be interested, except for Berlin's going to be in Colorado. Again? You're going to get tired flying back and forth. <laughs> Um, so if anyone is interested in that, let's see, who do we have that but not feel here? Um, I guess we don't have one other than, no. What? 
Who else abuts? It would be Roxbury, but Roxbury. Roxbury, right. nobody's. We don't have. You don't have a point deep enough for you. Yeah, so there's a point deep in the one meeting. Yeah. Um. All right, so that's just uh, you know make it available for the towns to participate Morton. in in the North Field Town Point, yeah, no, yeah. and that'll be at the next meeting, right? Correct. Say that, Laurie. The hearing will be at the November Commission meeting. November yeah. Commission yeah. meeting. Yeah. 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 I know. Let's try to figure out when you're going to meet. That's right. And we have Josh. I already figured Josh. out. Josh Oh, really? It's coming November. Oh, in November. Oh, okay. Because he was booked tonight. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. So, you gonna get on that, Larry? <laughs> when's the meeting, maybe? Uh, when's the first meeting? Thursday, November 6th. Is that when it is? Yeah, it's the Thursday before. Thursday before the commission meeting? At 4 p.m. at CBRPC, and it typically doesn't take longer than an hour. Yeah, I could do that. That should be tweeted here. At least there's okay. no financial <laughs> argument, Sam. What date, Kim? Yeah. I believe it's November 6th. That you'll be reminding us? part of the plan. Yes, it is November 6th. Yeah. Kim, you'll be reminding us? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, we need to appoint uh, two commissioners uh, to the regional uh, plan draft review committee. Uh, so, is anyone interested <coughs> in that? And Kim, maybe you can tell us what it's. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, we were looking to appoint uh, potentially two additional commissioners if there's any interest uh, to the draft review committee. Uh, Mike Miller, as you know, moved on to the city of Montpelier, is no longer serving on the commission. Um, and just based on attendance, you know, we'd like to have a, a little stronger connection between the full commission and the draft review committee. So that's the body that oversees all kind of final drafts of the plan um, as they come out of the working groups before passing along to the full commission for discussion and review. Um, they meet monthly, typically the first Tuesday of the month from 4 to 6 at CBRPC offices um so i guess we'd just like to see if there's any additional interest you don't have to make every meeting um but you know we like to see a sporting effort so we can have all those voices at the table well we'll appoint tim and that'll for being late <laughs> <laughs> so did you hear that tim no looking for um a uh two commissioners uh, to the Regional Plan Draft Review Committee. Um, so if you're interested in that. Tim's on it. I'm on it. He's on it. You're interested in filming two seats? <laughs> <laughs> this could be why you have low attendance tonight. The agenda came out. Yeah, yeah right. They were worried. Yeah. Well, what we'll do is anybody who missed it will disappoint them, you know. <laughs> Usually it works. <laughs> That'll teach them as a meeting, right? Um, okay, so anyone else? Uh, or anyone, period. Anyone, period. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll bring it up again next time. Yeah, okay. This is going to be ongoing pretty steady now, right? For a while. Pretty much. Uh, yeah. How long is it going to last, Kim? Uh, well, we'll be going through this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Ten Likely years. Likely spring 2016. Oh, 2016. Okay, yeah, we'll have plenty of time. <laughs> oh. okay. uh, I didn't even well, I guess now we're up for a speaker. Karen? Yes. Karen? Yeah, so um, we'll take a moment to get set up. I um, just want to introduce uh, Karen Nelson with the Department of Health in the Barry office. Uh, she's been serving and helping drive the efforts of the Central Vermont Food Systems Council these past few years, particularly uh, spearheading the Garden in Every School project. Uh, so the Food Systems Council, uh, the commission has played a role in the past. Uh, we led up the Central Vermont <coughs> Food Systems Assessment Project in 2012 uh, that Jackie had taken on with the Department of Health grant. 
um, and have been meeting with these stakeholders to identify kind of projects and actions that can be taken to strengthen Central Vermont's food system, uh, both from a community development standpoint, education, food security, um, it's kind of a multi-pronged approach. So uh, Karen's here to report on a recent success and accomplishment um, that uh, Washington County has achieved. Um, so, as Kim said, I work for the Department of Health and Therapy, if you don't want to know this yet. <laughs> um, uh, I'm the school liaison for the Barry District Office, and what uh, that means is that I assist all the schools in Washington County and the Orange North um, in implementing programs that improve the health of children, basically, in a nutshell. Um, and um, I'm here representing not only the Department of Health, but um, the Central Vermont Food Systems Council as well, which is a kind of a grassroots community organization that was formed um, a little over a decade ago, I guess. Um, and they have a, a mission to um, develop the food systems in, in the Central Vermont region, um, everything from, um, you know, supporting um, uh, family farms, supporting community gardens, um, trying to improve food security for people in the region, and um, also school gardens. Now, the Vermont Department of Health is, um, you, you know, has a, a, a pretty broad mission to um, encourage better nutrition in students and physical activity in students. And so the school gardens are one of the, uh, the points of convergence for, for me and my work, at least, um, in that um, they provide all of these benefits to children. Um, we have you know, numerous um, uh, amounts of research now that um, shows us that children who grow their own food, who grow their own vegetables, will eat the vegetables. It's, you know, surprisingly simple concept, but they become very, um, you know, they become very invested in, in the, in the uh, crops that they produce. And so um, we will have things like taste testing in schools and kids, you know, eating vegetables that they may never see at home and inventing vegetable dishes to um, share with their classmates and then usually what happens is the kids will vote on a dish, particular dish, during these taste testings and then the food service director um, in their school will put that on the menu as a regular um, recurring item for the kids to, to keep um, them familiar with the, with the dishes and the new vegetables that they've chosen to, um, to sample. So um, it's, it's uh, one of the things that I love doing as part of my job, um, and uh, so I became involved with the Central Vermont Food Systems Council um, about two years ago, I guess, and um, I learned of this project that they had had this mission for um, almost a decade of seeing a garden in every school in Washington County. Um, and so they were supporting school gardens through technical assistance and some small grants that they had raised money. Um, and, and I met a man named Joseph Kiefer, whom some of you may know, who uh, is one of the, the co-directors of uh, the Central Vermont Food Systems Council. And we started talking about this idea of garden in every school. And, and I visit the schools all the time as a part of my job, so I kind of had a sense that maybe we actually might be close to that. And I could just think off the top of my head of maybe one or two schools that I wasn't quite sure about. So um, I met with, um, with Joseph and with Hannah Reckow, who's one of the Mayor Corvistas who works with um, Kim, and we decided that we were going to take this on as a project. So last summer, Hannah and I went around to every school in Washington County and the Orange North Supervisory Union and we documented the gardens. We took pictures of the gardens, we interviewed the garden coordinators, we learned about the garden histories, and basically we were able to say with a, you know, with certainty that there was a garden in every school in Washington <coughs> County. Um, now Orange North is part of my um, service area as well, so I kind of always include Orange North in, um, in our projects. Um, 
and uh, we're very close there as well. So we, um, we decided that we were going to make this big announcement that we were the first county in Vermont to have a garden in every school. And of course, two days before the event, we found out that, well, no, we're not exactly the first county. <laughs> oh. <laughs> there are a couple of other counties um, that probably do have gardens in every school. But being a nurse, of course, I said, if it's not documented, it's not done. <laughs> so we stake claim to um, at least being the first to announce that we have a garden. <laughs> Get certified. You'll be the first certified. <laughs> yes. so we're, uh, we actually had, um, we had Rebecca Holcomb, the, uh, the, um, the Secretary of the Agency of Education, um, come and speak at our uh, garden event, which we had on October 2nd in Montpelier. And um, she presented those certificates to all of the schools uh, that you know were in attendance. And then I have the rest of them as well. I'm going to probably be delivering those over the course of the next couple of weeks. So uh, again, you know, this is a this is an ongoing project. We even though we do actually have a garden in every school, um, they of course range um, in size, as you can see from you know the fantastic setup that they have at Montpelier High School um, and say Barrytown Elementary School to some gar some schools that are just getting started and they've got one little patch of pumpkins out in the back of the school. Um, but again, it's a garden, and, and the key issue for us is if they actually incorporate the garden into their curriculum, and all of our schools do. So we call it gardening across the curriculum. So the idea is that the children are going to, this is going to become a learning, um, a learning garden for the kids. They're going to, you know, learn science and math and history and, you know, botany and art and all kinds of um, different uh, subjects that they're um, studying in school um, through the garden. So um, we are, uh, you know, this is a kind of an ongoing, <coughs> we've, we've hit this milestone, but we, we look at it as an ongoing mission because we want to keep supporting our gardens. They almost all are, you know, in need of um, some sorts of assistance from, um, you know, s grants, which we try to help them right um, and volunteers sometimes just they just need people to come over the summer when the kids aren't there and do some weeding and you know maybe just tend the crops and chase away the you know the critters that might be getting into the garden so um, you know we're, we're we're continuing this mission to to support the gardens and help them grow um, we have some of our some of our schools have um, great plans for increasing their garden space and their capabilities, um, especially in terms of uh, uh, incorporating it more into the curriculum. So um, we're looking to uh, find some resources for them to do that. And then, of course, um, we pretty much threw it on the gauntlet. You know, we want to see a garden in every school in Vermont. So um, we have the, the Vermont Community Gardens Association who are working on that same mission, and um, hopefully, you know, together between uh, you know us and, and them and all of the other um, school liaisons around the state that work for the health department, we'll see that come to pass because it's a, you know it's a part of the Vermont history. School gardens have been <coughs> in existence in Vermont since the 1800s, and they've just kind of waxed and waned a little bit. But there's a big resurgence now. And, we think now's the time that we can actually see um, and pass on these these um, skills and this knowledge to kids um, and the school students of Vermont in, in a way that you know hasn't been done in, in quite some time. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has, and um, I can talk about the, pic the slides if anybody wants to know which is which. <laughs> <laughs> Who's got the chickens? Yeah, um, right. So right now, well, uh, Montpelier High School has an entire industry. <laughs> I mean, uh, Tom yeah. Sabo is a teacher yeah. there who's, who's responsible yeah. for the gardens, and he, um, they, they built their gardens, and then they built their greenhouses, and then they, um, the kids put irrigation systems in, and the students do all this work. So th th this is the key thing to understand. Um, 
they have a garden which is actually um, a garden that they grow entirely for the food banks and for the homeless people in the area. They um, then they decided that they needed to make their own compost. So they got you know a compost system going. And of course, as anybody who gardens knows, one of the primary things you need for compost is animal waste. So they decided they were going to raise chickens, and they raised they raised the chickens. And the eggs are a byproduct to them. So they're raising the chickens to get the manure to make the compost for the gardens. Um, and they, they actually sell the eggs to the teachers. They have like a little mini CSA going in the school, and the teachers buy the eggs, and that helps to support the garden. And then um, I guess maybe last year, going into this year, they decided to do uh, fish farming. So they have this big tank in one of their greenhouses that they're raising fish. And again, it's a byproduct that they're interested in um, using for the gardens. Um, so that's, that's what's going on at Montpelier. Um, and then Barry Town um, started raising chickens just this year. They got them kind of like through the end of the school year last year. Over the summer, they built the, the, this beautiful chicken house and um, got these chickens. And um, they're actually... Um, using their eggs in their food, in their cafeteria, the managers, their food service um, company is buying their eggs um, to use in the school cafeteria. So. Um, and you know, I, as the Department of Health, I get lots of <coughs> nervous nurses calling me and saying, Mr. So-and-so wants to raise chickens, what are we going to do about that? Um, and so we have to make sure that, you know, everybody follows, you know, good hand washing and hygienic practices and the, and the kids get to learn about you know diseases that can pass from animals to, to humans and that's just another learning opportunity for them so I think it's all a very positive uh, thing for the kids. And orange has the pumpkin patch of trees. No, um, <laughs> actually um, so um, Williamstown Elementary School just put in seven new beds this summer, and they've got, you know, tremendous gardens going there. They've got, of course, the beautiful flower gardens if you've ever been there out in the front of the school. And um, uh, they've got tree growing, which is actually um, belongs to the school principal. The kids bought it for him, and they planted it right there in the midst of their garden. And the kids design um, and, and built and painted, I was there the day they were painting, um, a compost bin out in the back of the school, so they're going to be also starting to make their own compost from, from kitchen scraps in the, in the cafeteria. Um, so they've got a really nice, thriving garden, and the, uh, the um, fourth and fifth grade um, classes are using it in their science curriculum. Um, and then um, uh, Washington Village School and Orange Center School have beautiful gardens going. Um, there's a, a pizza, you know, like a pizza oven at, um, <laughs> at Orange Center School and um, this lovely little garden arrangement out in the back. So they, they're doing pretty well. Um, I'm still working on the high school, the Wingstown High School. They need a little bit of push because they have the facility, they have the greenhouse, they just need a little bit of um, you, you know, some resources to um, to get things going again, refurbish, we probably have to put in new beds and so on and so forth there. But, um, we'll, see, we'll see it happen, I'm sure, because I just keep on them until they do that, basically. But, um, no, actually, Pumpkin Patch was uh, is at Callis School. Callis School has these beautiful um, uh, raised beds out front of the school, which are growing flowers because the kids like flowers. They like to see the flowers um, grow and they pick them and make little bouquets for the mothers and so on and so forth. But um, this one of the second grade classes decided they wanted to grow pumpkins so they they dug a little bed out in the back for us every classroom. And they planted pumpkins last spring. So it's volunteers all summer long who tend the chickens and the so it varies, gardens? Well, it varies. I mean, what, usually when you take on a project like that involves live animals, um, some one person has to be ultimately responsible for that. So in both cases, at least, it's, it's a faculty member who's responsible for seeing that you know they are taken care of 
Um, but that doesn't mean they have to do it. They're just responsible for getting it done. Um, and actually, Montpelier has um, you know students who volunteer to work over the summer and for certain credits. Um, and um, in a lot of you know some of the places we have parents who volunteer to take like a week um, at a time of the summer, and it works out nicely because you know there are a lot of crops that are can kind of like. You know, if you start to get zucchini in the middle of the summer, you can't just let it sit. So whoever's doing it, whoever has that week in the garden is going to have a lot of zucchini bread for their family because the, the stuff is, you know, just gets picked and some of it can be processed and frozen, but a lot of it has to be used. So it works out really well for some, especially families who may actually need that food. Um, the Berrytown School has a library program that runs through the summer a summer reading program and they actually um, kind of this, during the weeks of the summer reading program the kids take care of them, that are there take care of the garden and it's part of their reading curriculum. But um, then there are some of the, you know, some of the other schools that, you know, have had trouble getting, you know, they've had you know, challenges in getting people to come and work over the summer and that maybe the coordinator lives too far away or whatever so they basically plant squash <laughs> and fall crops and things that are kind of be ready when the kids come back to school. Um, I noticed that a lot of these, or most of these gardens, actually don't appear to be fenced. And speaking from experience, uh, what do they do about deer? So, um, Berry Town is fenced. <laughs> <laughs> it's Bob's <laughs> <Bob's assignment. laughs> Um so Barrytown um, does have a fence around theirs. Um, so it depends on where the school is, really. Um, and um, the, the gardens tend to be like close into the building. So for the most part, you know, they're not totally bothered by the deer. Although Berlin is in the process of, you know, fencing their garden in because I think they probably get some deer up here, but. Um, Actually, you know, like for example, Barry City's been hounded by a woodchuck <laughs> for years and years and years. And so finally this summer they actually solved the problem with the woodchuck. And they did it by actually digging down beside every one of the raised beds and planting a fence around each of the raised beds to keep the woodchuck out. Because they couldn't keep them out of the garden. So um, even though they have a nice fence around it, it you know, woodchucks they still manage to get <coughs> Remind me, um, is information on the gardens available on the Department of Health's website? Or so, um, it's not on the Department of Health website. Um, it it makes its way on my our district Facebook <coughs> page. So, if you want to like the Vermont Department of Health Berry, <laughs> you'll get to see. Um, you know, we post about all sorts of um, health issues, of course, but um, I do try and. You know, put things on about the gardens and some of the other programs that I'm pretty active in supporting. Um, the Central Vermont Food Systems Council has a blog mm -hmm. that um, has information on that as well about the garden project. So, um, yeah, not, I believe that's linked from centralvtplanning.org, but that's CVFSC, the yeah. acronym for Central yeah. Vermont Food blog, Systems yeah. Council. Yeah. Or WordPress. Like yeah, WordPress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you so much, Karen. Good project. All right. And I guess Karen's email, if you have any questions, is your typical state yeah, <laughs> naming. Karen.Nelson at state.vt.us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that was. Um, that's wait. That's um. Faceton Elementary School, they have like a whole school day, and right there they're studying worms. Some kids are really good at them. And that's the soup they make from the garden. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your presentation. So who's up now, Kim? Yes. I'd like to think we're all up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, up at bat. <laughs> sure.
Okay, well we're hoping to continue the discussion about the economic element of the regional plan this evening. Um, what we circulated a week ago, and apologies, I wish we had given you more time for the most recent draft, but we were kind of working against a deadline. Um, so what you saw in this newest draft uh, were all the revisions made by the Regional Plan Draft Review Committee uh, between their August 26th meeting, their September meeting, and they met again in early October. <laughs> so they very diligently uh, worked through these policies and strategies and also, I believe, uh, made efforts to incorporate some of the comments that were received at the October, I'm sorry, the uh, September 9th commission meeting. Uh, where we last discussed. So what we circulated to you um, was both a new, clean version of the goals, policies, and strategies, and then a marked up version where you can see where all the changes were made and if there are any kind of comments to better explain where the draft review committee was going with that, that was in the right hand column. Um, we also circulated revisions to the uh, full economic element and also the summary version of the economic element, uh, which weren't substantial, uh, but they were noted in uh, either italics for additions or strike through uh, for a text that was going to be deleted. Um, so the email you were forwarded gave a quick punch list of some of the uh, changes that were made. Uh, which I was just going to walk through a couple of them real quickly. Uh, the first, uh, you noticed that a lot of the strategies were revised to better reflect uh, which organization would actually be leading the effort. Um, and if it's not CBRPC, it, it was more adapted to say that CBRPC would be collaborating with, partnering with, supporting, encouraging, um, as opposed to just leaving a blank directive without saying who was going to do it. Um, we reworked a number of the strategies that were previously in the agriculture, agriculture and forestry section of the goals uh, to, and this was one policy that was really just focusing on, um, you know, value added ag and forestry and industry support. So we reworded and moved a number of those strategies to the business development goal and worded them more broadly uh, so that they would reflect kind of all manufacturing. Um, in some cases it said, you know, comma, in particular, value-added food, um, but we thought we kind of more generalized a lot of those strategies there. Um, let's see. We reworded policy nine, which was the uh, livable wage statement to kind of better reflect supporting the business community and policymakers and, you know, developing strategies to pursue livable wage um, <coughs> as a goal. And I'm sure we'll talk through that in a moment. And I'll also note that, um, and this is a comment that, that came in from Sam, they thought was pretty valuable. Um, and I'll point you to a specific section um, on page two of this goals, policies, and strategies document. Uh, under the business retention, growth, and development goal, there's policy three, and there are strategies A through G under that. Um, and <laughs> G kind of gets to the meat of the efforts, I suppose, uh, which is meant to be kind of a catch-all that in order to achieve these strategies identified in policy three, that we will increase collaboration between the RPC, Central Vermont Economic Development, Capstone Community Action, and the Chamber. Um, and Sam suggested we move that up to be policy A, to kind of be the lead-in to make sure that it's clear that all of these other strategies will be accomplished through the partnership. Um, so we will be making that edit uh, after tonight. Uh, we were hoping to, again, continue the conversation, receive comments, discuss if there is potential to vote on whether the commission would like to recommend approval uh, to kind of put a stamp on the economic element for now. We can do that. Of course, we'll have to see if we're, we're going to get there or if there's still kind of substantive changes that need to be made. Um, but with that being said, I think we left off discussing livable wage and the policies and strategies under goal three, um, but we're certainly welcome to revisit any of the changes made in earlier sections or otherwise. So I guess we can start with the changes if you had a chance to review and whether you feel they accurately reflected uh, 
some of the comments made at the previous meeting. You take comments on the goals and policies? <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll be as brief as I could make myself be. Page 3, policy 4A, doesn't need the word small. <laughs> okay. Um. Policy 4F, <clears throat> doesn't need public in the last sentence. Sentence. I'm sorry? In the only sentence. Yes, yes. H doesn't need small. Are you saying change the whole policy for it to leave out small businesses? That was the idea. It was about um, encouraging small businesses. Policy for do you think don't have a small business in there at all? You want to encourage medium businesses? Well, yeah, I know. That's just I'm, I'm just trying to understand. You, you don't want this to be about small business development because that's what the intent was. New businesses, and small businesses. Where's the large business development? I think a lot of the other parts address that, but I'm just trying to understand what you're saying. That's fine. So I know. I'm saying I don't know why any of these things wouldn't apply to other businesses. Is that a question open for discussion? Uh, certainly a statement that's <laughs> open to rebuttal. Yeah, it is open. <laughs> <clears throat> well, it. Um, I will confess I've been really busy, so I have not read the entire document. So I'm just only looking at policy four, as um, Laura just mentioned. Policy four is addressing specifically small business development because, um, and someone who's a statistician can probably pull out the numbers that Vermont um, ha and uh, statistics have shown that small businesses in Vermont are more resilient in times of large economic volatility. And so I think policy four is responding to the need to develop more small businesses which need more support than medium or large businesses just by definition and because of what it takes to get a small business going. Also, small businesses tend to be established by people who already live in the state. Maybe they're unemployed, maybe they're retired, whatever. And so small business or micro business development is a particular niche in economic development that policy for is addressing. I'm simply asking what things in there would you not provide to yeah. businesses that weren't deemed small? Yeah. I guess one intention was not, it's not as though there's a gap in small business services, but there, you know, could be expansion of services provided to small businesses to get them up and expanding and growing and I guess one could argue that they, they kind of need more network and support from the outset that the large businesses are already receiving by sheer size. So it's kind of again as Renee said a strategy. About 80 percent of all biz oh I'm sorry. About 80 percent of all businesses in Vermont are deemed small. Mm -hmm. A greater percentage is deemed small by the federal government. And when you look at small businesses, some of them do wind up growing into really big businesses. Gardner's Supply, Ben and Jerry's, Cured Green Mountain, started as a coffee shop in the valley. So, hmm, you know, it's kind of splitting hairs because 80% of our businesses that we serve in economic development 
40 are deemed small. And that's 10 or under in employees. Just a factoid. Larry. Under uh, policy 4D, but it seems strange that you would uh, specify a certain organization. I mean, there's other entities that provide funding for small businesses, local banks. Because there are corporate. actually other entities <laughs> even besides us, right. although we provide it. But there think... are other partners, if you've heard about the road show that the Lieutenant Governor has been going on. It's a whole group of us. Mm -hmm. It's us and venture and angel investors that are setting up meetings throughout the state. Um, so um, to that point, there are numerous, actually, entities. There are like 10 organizations, and we're all collaborating together to bring this how to fund small entrepreneurs, you know, it, innovation and startups around the state. So, so this I, I would say you limit yourself. You could say, for example, but the reality is there are probably nine other entities that work on um, capital investment and opportunities to apply commercial strategies specifically for um, local business mm -hmm. and startups and innovators, entrepreneurs, just uh, as a point. I don't think I'd even go, for example, you just shouldn't pick one particular organization over another. You should just so that, we use some wording that there are organizations to work okay. with. Okay. Um, so this particular strategy or proposed project was proposed by a, a staff person, the Director of Community and Economic Development at Capstone Community Action. So I guess I don't know if what you're referring to is exactly the type of project she had in mind off, off the top of my head. I know this was kind of a specific type of framework based on a model of something going on in Portland that... Um, the organization was looking to replicate. Uh, it was mentioned at the regional SEDS meeting in October to try to get on the SEDS list. So I guess if it is in fact the same project as you're referring to, you certainly Well, there are multiple. I, I guess what I want to say is there are multi multiple strategies that are constantly being offered mm -hmm. to entrepreneurs, local businesses, for growth opportunities that have capital needs, investment needs, you know, and strategies. There's the Vermont SBDC, there's VSET, the Vermont Center for Emerging Technologies. It would just nice to, it would be nice to see the umbrella a little bigger okay. than one program, one solution. This was one instance where we saw opportunity to get specific. Uh, with a willing partner that was likely already going to be moving this initiative forward and that was right. one of the directives from our assessment to try to incorporate more specific projects that could be implemented. Um, right, so that's well why how we are you going to interface with that? Our staff, is staff going to be involved? Um, I mean if you're going to, to single out one program, what is your participation as an RPC? Well, we're really <laughs> so I, I have kind of organizing little... meetings and potentially providing data or background. We obviously we haven't discussed it to that point, right? Just yet. I um, just think you short sheet yourself well, when if you, you have, don't if acknowledge you have, other if you programs. Have, if you have suggestions on other programs that are similar to this, you know we can add them in. If you want, if we. I mean, I'd, I'd like to leave this in there. It looks like a good program. But if you have suggestions for others that should be included, maybe you should just tell us what they are. Send them to right. Send us and when is this being launched? Um, I actually have a request into um, the Director of Community Economic Development to suggest whether this is the most appropriate wording. I know we bounced it off her before um, when we were developing it, but I haven't heard back just yet. So this is one where... You know, I, w I wanted to get her opinion on what was the best wording for our plan. It could be grant dependent, so I think you need to be careful. Uh, just be careful and investigate it more before you identify one singular program, mm -hmm. because the Roadshow is a program that's very 
has been very successful in its first launch and there will always be these programs evolving. Mm -hmm. um, so really what you're trying to do is build up that network, not dependent on just one program, but dependent upon all the stakeholders providing the services 12 months out of the year, I would think. Okay, Julie? So, speaking to this topic, I mean, I was glad to see the reference to a specific partner because I, while I could see in several places there was an effort to identify partners, there were places where I thought there was a glaring lack of partners um, uh, available and that sort of disturbed me because while I think the goals in this policies and the strategies are appropriate for the region. Ultimately, it's the RPC that is the owner of this plan. And unless some of the part, uh, unless, unless the strategies <coughs> are within the competency of the RPC, or we have identified partners to work with on that, <coughs> then I'm going to question whether the strategy is going to make a lot of sense. Um, in this particular, in this one specific instance that we've been talking about, I think you could probably draft the um, strategy just a little more vaguely and the implementation of that strategy could be this one project that you flag um, I, and, and still have it meet the concerns about having something that's implementable um, and very specific for what the RPC is doing to implement that strategy. So calling out capstone in this one case may not be critical, um, but having something a bit to, to um, strengthen, <coughs> seek out and strengthen the networks and look for the opportunities to do something, you know, to engage on, and, and is something where you can have that strategy meet your intent, and then the implement actual implementation of that project. If this one's ready to go then that could be the project and, and the partner wants RPC involvement and that could be the, the implementation of it. But I think in several cases, um, policy 6, policy 8, policy 9, policy 11 are ones that I sort of looked at and I said, you know, is the RPC really able to do this without partners and it's not really clear where we'd be seeking these partners from. Um, I was a little concerned that there wasn't enough clarity about the need for you know, get, having partners to, to work on these strategies with because I don't see that the RPC is capable of doing some of these strategies without partners. Mm -hmm. And if the partners aren't, aren't clearly identified, then it sounds like the RPC is going to be the one who's trying to do this. And I just don't think it's possible for the RPC to do all of these things without having identified partners. Well, we don't really okay. know. <laughs> oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, Larry? I, I agree with what you say at a certain point, but these this plan is going to be in existence for eight years, right? Now? And uh, eight. These, eight. these different partners and different projects come and go every couple of years. <laughs> the projects come and go. Right. The partners hopefully are, some of them are established. Right, but I mean, like just bringing up, I think we should need to word it so that we, we support partners in different projects and different grants or whatever it may be, but not specifically name them because four years from now, someone might be looking for a certain type of partner or project to help them with something and it might not necessarily be this, but it might be something else. And they, they could look to the RPC to find out where they could go to get help or whatever. But no, I, I just not, I'm not comfortable with just specifically putting one organization over another. I mean, no, I understand what you're saying. I'm, I'm, my concern is just making sure that it's clear that we're looking to economic development, you know, existing economic development organizations as partners or we're looking to schools as partners or we are looking to, you know, I, I can see that there's some reason for maybe to not specifically identify, you know, a particular organization, but I think it really needs to be clear that we're looking to find the partners to support, to facilitate, to network through, and we're looking for partners of a specific type. Um, and I don't think that's always clear enough. I know there's work that, that there was some real effort to try and get that clear.
clear, but I think on some of these policies, it's it's not coming through. Well, and it is why we use the words promote, facilitate, support, explore. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> and that's, that's, in many cases, again, yeah, we don't know what exactly the opportunities are going to be. We have these 12 state goals that we're trying to make progress towards that, you know, we don't have the in-house capacity to do most of these things in reality. We know that, but I guess I don't see why we still don't want to identify them as opportunities that might advance these goals in the plan. Um, One thing. Uh, Renee. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, so I was just looking at the sequencing of A through H in policy four and wondering if it would help to satisfy some of Sam's concerns if um, before identifying a particular organization, um, you inserted um, to identify all potential partners that may have the capacity to explore blah, blah, blah. <coughs> so we, if, if we move... Instead of working with one organization, mm -hmm. if you identified all uh, potential partners that had the capacity to explore opportunities, et cetera, and so forth. Okay, so under policy four? Four D. Four D. Um, so, okay, so and, and I'm all. just throwing that out as a consideration as a step before you would say work with this person or this group. You would just identify everybody who has the capacity to do that task. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, hold on. Sam? You, you, uh, oh, um, I actually didn't have any heartburn over this. <laughs> <laughs> until George started going with the take out the word small, take out the word public. Um, because of the fact that we statistically have so many small businesses. I, I guess maybe a way to show the compatibility with strategies, my only comment would be, and the event is not happening until October 28th, and I don't want to screw up your timetable, but the statewide SEDS is a first. Mm -hmm. We're the first state to have a statewide certified economic development strategy that's been approved by the federal EDA. And maybe we can somewhere put in here that we hope to support identified strategies and projects that apply to central Vermont mm -hmm that are identified in the statewide SEDS because that has an ultimate stakeholder partnership of a couple of hundred. So you kind of put it then in that overarching umbrella because you're referring to a document created by all the stakeholders and approved by the EDA. And that actually is the one document that puts uh, meat in the bones you then can in can propose s projects for the statewide sets that could actually be funded by the EDA and that's where you've got the shovel in the ground and you're actually moving the ball down the field because if we can get funding for some of these it would be terrific yeah that was so certainly on a all else I'll back off but on this <laughs> To have it mentioned so when projects in Waterbury or Berlin or Williamstown come up that are infrastructure projects or anything else, Steve, I'm looking right at you because mm -hmm. of Barbara Farr and, and, and sure. you know, feasibility studies. If you tie this element in your plan to the said statewide strategies, you can then use that in an application to, to um, get some funding for actual projects. Yeah, so that'd be my only recommendation for for additional, uh, for one ad addition. Where are you going to put that? Good luck, young lady. Um, well, I mean, one, one hope was that through this process, we would also identify projects, strategies in here that we could 
get on the statewide SEDS list. Right, but you need to mention how you support how? the statewide SEDS yeah. in, your element, in your economic development element because then that puts you in the position to move the ball down the field with specific mm. projects. Just sure. a thought. I know we did put it in here somewhere. Okay. Not, not in like an umbrella sense like you're saying. We'd have to edit it, but now I just can't. Okay. Uh, I'm well, happy to work with yeah. you on that. Um, to present to your commission, at, you know, at the next meeting or something. Yeah, we incorporated but, it into Policy 11, Strategy B, but for a very specific type of initiative. So okay. we can definitely pull it into a broader policy okay. strategy also. That's the STEM. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, all right identified in the 2020 statewide SEDS. Maybe we could add a few words there to talk about the support for the SEDS. Mm -hmm. And it's being un unveiled October 28th at the second economic, statewide economic development summit being put on by the Department of Economic Development for the state. If you have nothing better to do for a day, come up to the Dudley Davis Center we're all going to fix everything in a day. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. Good luck, Larry. Yeah, and back to what the uh, name Renee. is. Renee. What Renee was saying about listing some. Now, the only problem with that is, this is an eight-year plan. The ones that you list now, some may, may or may not exist four years from now, and there may be five new ones. So what if you had the wording like, because uh, this is going to be in existence for eight years for people to look at who knows when. Um, referred to the website for uh, updated list of possible partners for whatever you what you're looking for. Hmm. That way, everybody's included that's currently involved with, it, with whatever, and it wouldn't be just specifically promoting half the people, half the organizations that are out there. It's just for lack of better words. And that way, they'd have a you know as the, with the email technology stuff, they'd have a updated thing current. So Larry, we could potentially put in not like a footnote, but something as an, in an intro or at the end that notes that, you know, particular partners may have changed. Something to the effect of refer right. to you. Well, I think we should leave names out of here for now and just, if they want to, five years from now, if they're looking at something, they can find out who's involved at that point. Do we? Um, maybe maybe the sort of solution to some of this is is wording along the lines of seek partners funding and specific projects to do excellent something or other um, and and if need be put an adjective in front of the partners economic development partners economic development and school partners whatever it is that you need to do and that that way it's really clear y you need partners you need funding and you're looking for you know some specific projects. Is it because the project doesn't have to be in the strategy per se, but your objective should be clear in the strategy. The projects are to implement the strategy, um, and so so if somebody says, "How did you how did you do this strategy?" You could say, "You did this project, this project, and this project." The strategy doesn't have to identify those three because they can change. Yeah. Um, so so you are you suggesting that we take out? All of the partners in here, including Central Vermont Economic Development Corporation and the Chamber of Commerce, because those are in the policy in all above. Because I, George, we're going to be around for eight years. <laughs> well, so, I mean, no, I if think that's the rule. <laughs> I think if we we're going to say specifically for you know certain types of collaborations that you're saying are really key, and and one you're mentioning is. Goal to policy three, which is item C, correct? Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem saying we view these three as being absolutely critical and we're going to name these three. Somebody else might think differently about that. But I think on the other, on the other um, uh, policies and strategies where I was saying I think there's a need to make it clear that there are partners, maybe the seek, seek partners funding in specific projects too may be the way of sort of finessing that. But it's clear, this isn't an RBC doing this alone. This is an RBC <coughs> working to help move this forward with others.
Anything else on that? And I do apologize for overlooking my note on small in the policy for the statement to start that. Well, okay, so how do you... So you strike that too, George? Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's nothing in any of these policies that anybody who wants to see jobs would say we can't allow that to happen with anything but small businesses. <clears throat> well, a lot of these and there's no corollary later on that says, and we'd like to have technology transfer between colleges and IBM or large employers. Um, technology transfer between businesses and institutions is universal. Unless we're opposed to large businesses getting it, if we if that's the case, I'd really like to know that. Yeah, I don't think anything was written to be. Yeah, we certainly explicit. don't want to discourage them. As we certainly don't want to discourage them. I think this was about opening up opportunities for small, even home-based businesses, and trying to break down barriers. A lot of people would like to work out of their home, but because of zoning or whatever other regulations. At this point, they may not be allowed to, and that was identified as a problem, and that was what this policy was about fixing. There's no problem with larger businesses. Well, there's doing usually business zoning. zoning. There's zoning for commercial, and there's zoning for industrial a lot of times. But in you know residential areas, it, excuse me, it may be more difficult for home businesses to be started, and home businesses turn into small businesses, and small businesses turn into larger businesses, and I think this was just about providing opportunities for that to happen. It wasn't about excluding medium or large businesses. I would say promote entrepreneur, and I, I apologize, I took it. I won't start raising my hand now, I haven't been doing that. <laughs> um, promote entrepreneurship and innovation is meant to refer to all businesses, because pe people can be entrepreneurial and innovative within large businesses. Um, but we also want to see that entrepreneurship and innovation spin off into new businesses. Um, I hope nobody's got the impression that I don't. Oh no, of course. I'm just. I guess I'm trying to frame how it, it isn't meant to be exclusive. But I mean, I can stand at the front of the parade saying "yay, yay, small business," mm -hmm. but I don't see anything in here that wouldn't apply equally to non-small businesses by any definition. Okay. So I think I understand where you're coming from. Um, and I'm trying to think of an apt metaphor that takes it out of this context so that you can understand the special needs that are identified in policy four. I'm, I'm well aware okay. of the special needs. So I think that's all that's, ha that's, that's all that's... Um, and I don't think you lose them by taking small out. Hmm. I, I think it's safe to say that national life doesn't need the technical assistance that the average small business does. Or at least that they're likely to get it from other sources. But they still need technical assistance, they just generally buy their own. They have other avenues. Small businesses have fewer avenues. That's clear. A lot of this is going to be much more likely with small businesses, but to state it in a way that's repeatedly small, 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 makes me wonder if we're opposed to large, large, large. Well, maybe if we move on to different policies, we'll see other parts of the discussion that address. <coughs> I mean, we're just... Yeah, I mean, I clearly get that sense. <laughs> Regulations are a challenge for businesses. Zoning is a challenge for businesses of all size, but the, the example is home businesses. Well, yeah, they have that problem too, but it's not exclusive to them. And it sounds, it sounds in the conversation like we love small and we don't really care a whole lot about those other guys. Well, policy six, for example, goes on to talk about larger businesses and other things. Policy seven goes on to talk about specific other businesses that tend to be larger scale businesses. Um, Policy, policy 8 in talking about continued use and sustainability of natural resources is talking about associated industries. 
So I just think that it's important to acknowledge all businesses and all scales of businesses and not feel like there can't be one policy that focuses on and it's only saying small bit I mean you could have used the term micro business enterprise or something like that you just said small so that's more encompassing than micro business so um, if you can we could go we could go is through. that you would deny to larger businesses nothing's being denied as far as I can tell it's just that policy for is talking about small businesses many of the other policies which you folks who are more familiar could probably point out for George are talking about larger businesses it's like saying let's talk about education but we're not going to talk about our kindergarten kids because that's being exclusive well no it's not we're talking about all of education but we also want to mention kindergarten kids here too that's that's In, all you cited three different policies Renee that apply to large businesses that focus on large businesses can you show me the word large in any of those policies? Industries, Industries. Imp implies large. Commercial implies large. I don't I don't want to I don't want to argue with you. I'm just trying to help you to understand through a broader context that in developing an economic development policy that it's okay to talk about the different aspects of all kinds of businesses. Just like when you're talking about education, it's okay to talk about high school kids here, kindergarten here, community college. It doesn't mean that you're being exclusive. It just means you're finding a place for each aspect of the society that might that want to be included. To be comfortable accommodating and to find a middle ground, I'd feel a whole lot more comfortable if we got rid of all the small references and added a policy that said smaller businesses may need more help than larger businesses. Okay, Kim, you were going to mention something. And since you're the one writing the program, you're welcome to uh, address uh, people's questions at any time during the discussion. Okay. I don't know, we may have gotten past what I was going to say already. I was just going to say with policy four, we could, in theory, shorten it to say promote entrepreneurship and innovation because I think it by proxy gets towards, you know, starting new small businesses and expanding small businesses as that's what they do. So do large businesses, but um, I think that would be more encompassing. Um, I guess I, I would agree with Renee that a lot of these other policies just by proxy support large businesses and that goal two being a business development goal applies to all businesses and this is a recognition that small businesses have special needs for assistance I suppose yeah. in the kind of smaller phases. Um, yeah. But yeah, I guess. So and that you, takes place on every, in every town planning commission when you're talking about your village area when you're going to accept small businesses and when you're not. You know, what, what, you know, what's going to constitute the zoning as to what you're going to accommodate. So, I don't, I don't know, maybe there's a better way of wording it um, so that it uh, satisfies George's concern that the mere mention of small business excludes everybody else. Yeah, uh, it question. doesn't sound like it to me, but uh, he works around this more than I do, so <laughs> he may have a point. I'll be happy to rattle through and then get outvoted. And then get what? <laughs> and then get outvoted. <laughs> That's the spirit. <laughs> Policy five, I can't find a reason for it to be there. Um, at the very least, it can be combined with ten. Policy five is goal five. Goal five is is implementing policy five. It covers all the same ground, only in much more detail. 
Well, I guess I would know just from the committee standpoint that goal five was felt to be you know, included in a slightly different framework. Right? Policy five is definitely yes to catch all of all kind of quality of place factors, including scenic agricultural and forest land. Goal five gets to the point that we value these so much, but if we can't make the economics work, we will lose them. So that we need to make the economics work too and kind of reinforcing that. Even even if it's, you know, not not very free market, um, but just kind of a, a reality that broad efforts are going into this because we want to keep these lands, but they need to we, people need to be able to make a living. How can we support that? So it's a nod to a slight, slightly separate, very much related um, concept. Okay, Julie. I'm going to offer a wordsmithing suggestion that might solve the problems that we were discussing on policy four, which would be promote business entrepreneurship and innovation, comma, recognizing that small businesses may need additional assistance. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can delete other references to small businesses, and it might sort of be the way to finesse this. I, I, liked, I was going to say, I, I like George's idea of like expressing his viewpoint and being willing to be voted down. <laughs> I liked that. I, I appreciate it. Because it's, a, it, it's theoretical. What kind of businesses are you trying to, pro, to promote? Keeping in mind that 80% of all businesses in Vermont are small. Small business. You look at central Vermont and say, what kind of business do you want to encourage? So it, it, it's really your philosophy on what kind of businesses you're trying to grow. And um, I hear George, and I spend time with the larger employers. I don't like to call them industrial because <laughs> traditional industry is long gone. There are no smokestacks in central <laughs> Vermont. There's the clear smell of coffee <laughs> and drive by Comes Waterbury's <laughs> exit, but we don't see a smokestack. Um, so you really need to ask yourself, are you keeping the word small in there because this policy addresses something you really want to encourage. And you as commissioners need to do that. So it's really hearing George and hearing you and then taking a little poll. I don't think it has to be as formal as a vote unless this is George really wants to go to the mat on this one. But, and asking yourselves, are we encouraging the smaller businesses so that uh, because we believe there is a greater opportunity for resilience over the long term. <coughs> and I can argue that coin on either side if you want. But I, I really think you're talking about your philosophy here, keep the word or not. You can't include everybody in everything. So what are you trying to promote? If you're trying to promote small business at the expense of medium or large businesses, that's one thing, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, but but it, it doesn't this. it doesn't sound that way to me. No. But you know, it, it, I suppose a broad interpretation could uh, do that. Ron, you had your hand up. Oh no, I was just going. Uh, when I read small business, I so I think I I thinking what George is thinking. Just on reading that, those first words said, "Oh, small business." Um, how about the other businesses? That would be my question. Are we going to take the same, uh, you know, promotion thing, maybe not to the same extent, but same promotion attitude to bigger businesses as we do to small businesses? I think maybe that's what George was getting at. And for instance, like any of these policies, uh, broadband for small business, are we going to say big business shouldn't have broadband or some something like that? That's a, that's the way I, I my my first impression when I read it. After the discussion, I realized that probably wasn't intent, but it's 
seems to. You got that impression. Yeah. Got that big impression. Big business yeah. starts out small. Okay, Larry. I'm with George on this one. I mean, we should be, should be supporting and promoting all types of business, small or large. We need all we can get. Well, hopefully that's yeah. what we're trying I, to I would do, agree. We don't need to keep saying small, uh, small, small. Right? So, so, so how about if on every sentence that says small, we, we uh, are going to assist small, medium, and large businesses? Why do we no. have to say that? Does that, just, does that make it just, any clearer? Why do we have to do that? We just say business. We support business. Yeah. You'll have to segregate between one or the other. Yeah. yeah. They all have needs. Yeah, it's an interpretation. Now let's see if Tim's version. Um, <laughs> I can't argue either point, but I can say that the purpose of the plan ought to be not what you can and can't do, but the people who live here. And can they continue to live here? Can their kids live here? Is there enough work for them? Is it safe? Um, that's not being put out in this plan, as I've seen, to make the people first and the society first and not to ignore the history of the state and what people have been. Um, and to, to save a dose of that would be very wise. So what in particular on this um, document would you change to? The one that we're talking about right now? Small, medium, and large businesses? Um, <laughs> I think George is right on saying that um, you shouldn't be putting down big business or make it look that way. And the reality is, the rules and regs say that's all you can have anyway, in many ways. Unless somebody big wants to come in and put in their own sewer and water and all that, and some town happens to be saying, why not? It'll, you know, that should be possible at least. Um, it may be a rinky-dink place, but it may be the perfect place well, you can have a lot of businesses and a lot of jobs. And it's that notion that's not getting through on this planning we're doing right now. And it should be focused towards the people, the families, the history, and the future. And with the economy the way it is, it doesn't look like it's getting any better. It seems like the world's on fire. Um, I think Let, we got to start worrying line. about the citizens that are in our towns, yeah. the elderly that are in there, the people that are getting elderly, and not try to attract so much <coughs> money into the towns. It kind of takes it over where it's not the neighborhoods and uh, the people in the schools and so on. You know, once your kids are out of the school, you don't know who the hell they are. But they keep coming, and they keep building McMansions. Um, how are the people that have been here forever going to be able to stay here? That's more important than all this other stuff. And, it, and I don't think it's been addressed yet. And uh, Kim, while I have a recommended change for 6D, but I had my hand up. I would up. like to congratulate. I would like to congratulate you and the committee and others for policies six and seven, uh, which are qual quality pieces if we weren't being directed. So I, I would suggest indeed that we assist, like we do with small businesses commercial, industrial, and institutional uses that do not require a rural location in finding suitable locations in downtowns, villages, and adjacent areas. Okay. Uh, next one. Renee. Renee. Thank you. So, <clears throat> I, I was going to say something a little bit different but I was also focusing on policy six and policy seven in particular. 
Um, policy 6 talks about ensuring the availability of commercial and industrial space to meet employment and business expansion needs. And um, I have absolutely no problem at all with George's recommendation to assist commercial, et cetera, and so forth to find locations in downtown. I think that's great. I have no problem with the change of language. Um, but I want to play devil's advocate here now and just say, you know, number six and number seven are really excluding small businesses. They're not focused on the needs of small business. And I'm really playing devil's advocate just to point out that in all of the policies and all of the goals that I've seen so far, you've done a really exemplary job in trying to be inclusive in identifying the needs of all businesses and that Sometimes it's really important that a policy is specific, such as policy six is very specific to commercial and industrial space in times of business expansion. Which is neither big nor medium nor small. Right. It applies to all of the above. You can write six and seven and say small businesses and it would be equally applicable. The point is why would you do six and seven for small businesses, eight and nine for medium, and ten and eleven for large when because they all have the same needs? Because the needs are needs? different. They don't all have the same needs. Commercial and industrial expanding businesses have their set of needs. Energies, utilities, facilities, transportation elements that require different infrastructure, they have their set of needs. And whether you say a small business or micro business or um, cottage industries for our uh, current, so I think number four actually does address a lot of your concerns, Tim because the people who want to stay here who can't get jobs with larger corporations when they can get micro business development assistance they can generate their own micro business economy and it is a unique set of needs just like um, a mid-size or a large size or a, a particular telecommunication or transportation or um, green energy business. They just have their own sets of needs specific to their scale and their focus. And I don't think there's anything wrong in the plan with identifying each one of those sets of needs. And I want to commend the Regional Planning Commission for doing a really good job on that. Okay, Steve, you? Yeah, I just wanted to go back to um, four, and I think um, Based on the flood recovery, um, I think one of the big issues for small businesses was access to capital and um, this uh, program that um, Sam has been involved with is a good example. I think what I would suggest um, that we that we leave everything broad except um, down in the strategies, I think we could include something about um, special consideration for small businesses, especially accessing capital because um, I agree that all all of these aspects I think apply equally across the scale of businesses but you know we certainly find in Waterbury that our use of our revolving loan fund uh, this um, you know fund the CDBG DR fund this what's now you know two million dollars has largely gone to small businesses so I um, what I would suggest is that the only place we would mention small is in uh, policy 4c um, we could add where it says identify policy and programmatic, programmatic gaps and opportunities to expand access to capital uh, for businesses, particularly knowledge-based. Say something to the effect of recognizing that small businesses may need special consideration. Or something that would just acknowledge that um, there needs to be some, <coughs> some process of outreach and, and some resource uh, availability that uh, does give, um, I don't know 
if it's preferential treatment, but is specifically geared to, um, or at least act as easily accessible for, for those businesses. Because that, that is a really huge issue, I think, for, for small businesses. And, and I have no problem, as long as, as long as it doesn't suggest that large businesses don't have a problem with capital. Yeah. Because they have every bit the problem. But uh, saying this, the, you know, special outreach to small businesses who may not be aware or may don't have the resources to find on their own, I think is fine. I, I think those kinds of references in some cases are appropriate. I mean, I have no problem with talking about small wastewater systems. I'm not opposed to big ones, but there there is a utilization and an opportunity for small ones. Um, yeah, so I think, I think it's important to mention that because, you know, it, support of revolving loan funds, is these sort of grant programs, and disaster recovery is a really good example where the small businesses were the ones that struggled the most to survive, and some didn't survive for whatever reasons. Yeah. Okay, Larry? Could somebody tell me what defines small business? Was it it, well, employees? it depends on if you go with the federal um, definition. definition. All of Vermont, with the exception of, you know, IBM is, and Fletcher Allen Healthcare is considered a small business. 95% of the business is Federally, in Vermont. Federally, it's 500. Federally. 500 yeah. employees. Um, but 500 employees is a small business? Well, four ninety nine is small. I'm not sure what five, five is. Well, <laughs> so why we even have this discussion? Well, really, I mean, I, I've got to tell you, <laughs> you just, I give the same attention to a business with one to ten employees that I give to a business with five hundred to a thousand or more, because no larger industry. Came, every large industry came out of a small business. They grew from a small business. Ben and Jerry's were two guys, out-of-state guys, with ice cream and a hippie van. <laughs> Kira Green Mountain was a coffee shop in Waitsfield. You know, SB Electronics started out small making little capacitors. Some of our biggest employers right now, folks, are in our healthcare industries. Our hospitals are huge employers right now. Um, I don't have a crystal ball to say which one's going to make it big and which isn't. I do know that most of Vermont, and particularly central Vermont, is made up of small businesses. And I don't have the heartburn that George has over identifying needs for small business. Like, I just don't because a lot of them grow to I, bigger and bigger businesses. Pony Express was one guy in his basement in Barrie. He's got 25 employees and is reaching, has global customers. Now, when he called me up, I didn't blow him off, thank you God, because he is a prime example of small business that grows, and some small business seems the same. But we, we've we only had two businesses, really, that have come into so It's like affordable housing, Larry. It depends who wrote, who wrote it, who reads it, and under what definition you're reading it. So I guess what I'm pointing getting at, yeah, I agree yeah. with what George is saying. If the threshold is 499 people, so it's considered it's still considered to be a small business, and there's only a handful of right. have more than that. Why do we have to rate small business every year? Because actually, I think Vermont's definition is different. <laughs> it's, it's ten, right? It's ten I and under. All ten under yeah. We yeah. talk yeah. about ten yeah. and under. Right. Well, and, I, that's what I was thinking. And, not four ninety nine. Yeah. And and one of the factors driving uh, that, Tim, and I think about it a lot, is infrastructure. Uh, in the valley, we look at infrastructure. What do we have? I mean, do we have water? Do we have sewer? You know what I mean? So how can you expand without those things? And can the taxpayers afford to put that in place to attract these businesses in there? And these businesses are looking for that, <coughs> that uh, kind of uh, service. The sub-business need very little of that. Pardon me? Sub-businesses need, need, need very little, like an office. That's right. Business, you only need yeah. 
15 gallons per employee. Like a three-bedroom yeah. house needs 450 gallons yeah. for one house. <laughs> so yeah, right. That's that's the difference you look at. Yeah, but you still, you know, well, probably wouldn't need sewage either, but it depends on what well, they're doing. Well, that's what I'm doing. saying for sewage. Yeah. Right. Some type of business needs very little sewage and water capacity. Yeah. Versus others need a whole lot of it. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're probably okay for some specific businesses. I mean, like Warren and Waitsfield. Uh, Waitsfield now now has uh, water, um, and uh, Warren doesn't. So, you know, it's kind of a struggle, and the businesses seem to surround uh, Waitsfield as opposed to Warren. So, you know. Yeah. Um, but, yes. But without public infrastructure, any business park becomes limited. Exactly. Without yeah. infrastructure. Kim? Um, well, I'm still not 100% sure where to land on this. I guess I just wanted to note that when we were, you know, crafting this language, I was honestly thinking of it to akin, you know, using the word industry typically conjures up the notion of a larger business and, you know, most regions have a small business development center and you know, like an economic development and or industrial development core that typically deals with larger businesses. So I thought it was kind of similar nomenclature that's used with economic development stakeholders broadly. And the irony is at an economic development yeah. summit, if you have 100 people there and you give them all a piece of paper and say, write down what you think economic development is, <laughs> you have 100 different or 200. answers. <laughs> yeah, right. For some, it's agriculture. I, we, mm. We now refer to industry as industry sectors, and that encompasses everything. Agriculture is an industry sector. Forestry is a sector, industry sector. Um, industrialization is thankfully something uh, Vermont doesn't have to worry about. We're not Bethlehem, Pennsylvania that had steel factories. It's how you want to proceed as a region and the types of businesses you want to help grow and uh, that's key mm -hmm. so you're making again I say a philosophical decision when you decide to include policy for with the word small and that's up to you guys I'm not a voting member so Laura could I just I don't see it as it being a question about philosophy and what kind of businesses we're encouraging and which ones were like you seem to think discouraging this was about the way i saw it was that this was about identifying some problems that maybe existed and one of those problems was that home-based businesses and maybe small businesses have a hard time starting up i mean this is about startup businesses and so policy four was about addressing a problem that I assume the working group saw because I think you guys must have had something to do with this being in here. Pardon me? Some, the, working, the working group, the economic development working group, No. I assume had something to do with this. We discussed policies at the... General policies. July, but I've got to tell you, I don't see... May. I don't see policy for as addressing a problem. I see it as meeting, <laughs> finding ways to meet an opportunity. Exactly. So we're, well, we're that's looking not for. What you said. We're you looking said a for. Problem. We're looking for opportunities to address. I mean, if if home-based businesses and small businesses are having trouble getting started, and it seems like in a lot of cases, from what you hear, they are. This was meant to address that. This no, was they're not, actually not. Excuse me. Well, I I'd like to disagree if I could. Yeah. I, yeah. Right. I, I think I think you're wrong. <laughs> um, I think it's a huge challenge, Sam, for small businesses, that especially during stressful times. I mean, I, and the flood recovery is a perfect example where, you know, especially Waterbury, the Mad River Valley, the small businesses had a terrible time. They did. So did the large ones that were affected. The whole state complex with all oh, yeah. 1,500 employees went underwater. Everybody had a hard time. Everybody. Residents, business, everybody. It's an opportunity. If yeah. you look at the number of businesses registering with the Secretary of State's office, the largest one are small LLCs and sole proprietorships. 
there aren't big businesses coming into the state and there are startups. It's an opportunity to encourage, to help them grow. I, sure. I hate to use the word problem or challenge. No, no, I, I, You're right. The flood <laughs> devastated everybody in Waterbury. But it was everybody. And three Keurig, out of five Keurig good suffered times. huge losses. Yeah. They had the the resources to come up. And now we're coming in with what will be a total of two and a half million dollars for the smaller businesses. Right. But Keurig suffered big six figure losses to their equipment also. They just felt that everyone else needed the resources more than they did. And when I called them, they said, yes, we had big losses, but no, we're not going to apply. In Waterbury? Yeah. Well, the, there was trains, the base of the train station was flooded. Yeah, they also had other damage, according yeah. to them, yeah. that I spoke to them about. And they said, no, help the other businesses. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what I see, Kim. You can't seem to be satisfying both sides 100%, so you get it right on the mark, right in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I'm okay, so uh, we got to get close to wrapping it up here. Is there something else you need, Kim? To, uh, <laughs> Poor Kim. <laughs> no, no, at this point, I she's just had think enough. you did a great job, and you're wending your way through this discussion admirably. We yeah, the one thing you're hearing, me, Kim, years. is uh, you did a great job. So. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, I guess we can take one more brush at policy four specifically. So um, a number of ideas were thrown out, and I might have to just do some thinking. <laughs> <laughs> um, and otherwise, I guess we'd accept additional comments on the remainder of the strategies and policies, ideally in the interim. I know some of them are important to hash out in a group setting, but if we can get some of the smaller stuff. Be careful not to make it like a federal document and have half of it redacted. <laughs> I would not like to do that. I think we're really close. Um, I guess we can try at the November meeting. Okay. Well, you uh, well, I was just going to say I've been listening and waiting to come around to saying that I think goal number three is wonderful. And... Um, Goal number four, wonderful goals, and um, the policies seem, you know, seem to, goal number five, I, I mean, I think you've done a really nice job pulling out and teasing out really strong goals, and, and I agree, I think you're really pretty close in having developed the policies that might bring about those goals. I, so I just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> All right. Moving so. forward. <laughs> Are we good to go? Yeah. On this? You know, this has uh, really been an interesting discussion. We didn't have a full house here, but, um, you know, there was uh, a lot of participation. Everybody, but everybody. Got into it. Been a very interesting. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. See what you right. stirred up, George. Right. <laughs> I love all businesses. I know. All. We all do. Clearly. <laughs> Named and unnamed. That's not the point. <laughs> we all do. <laughs> okay. So I think we're about ready to wrap up this meeting. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. We have a second? Second. Then let's vote with our feet. <laughs> Thank you, folks. <laughs>